scientists, are you ready to observe, explore, and discover? It's time for Fun Lab TV! From sunny Los Angeles, let's go to the California Science Center with your hosts, Mariela and Monica. Hi, scientists! Welcome to Fun Lab TV here at the California Science Center. Our show is made up of three segments that show you how science happens here, here, and everywhere. First, follow us as we guide you through our virtual field trip. Together, we'll explore the California Science Center and answer a question of the day. Next, we'll ask you to get curious and make observations in Check It Out. Wait, when do we do science? Well, you may be thinking that since this is a TV show, we won't be doing science. Ha ha! Think again, scientists. Our final segment is called Stuck at Home Science, where we explore a science concept with materials you can find at home. So scientists, that means you'll need some supplies. Don't worry, we'll give you enough time to get what you need. Here's a list of the things you'll need for the show today. While you watch, have an adult help you find what you need. Today you'll need an eraser, a marker, one balloon, scissors, a piece of tissue paper, a round paper plate, wool or any type of cloth, and you'll need a pencil and paper or a notebook for the whole show to help you keep track of everything you discover. I think we're ready, scientists! On with the show! Hi scientists, welcome to virtual field trips at the California Science Center. Before we get started, there are a few things we need to go over. All virtual field trips will have a question of the day. And today's question is, why is it important for habitats to have many different types of living things? This is the question we will be investigating today. Feel free to draw or write notes in your notebook to help you answer the question. All virtual field trips will also have a buzzword. Today's buzzword is... Diversity. Anytime you hear this word, be sure to make check marks or tally marks somewhere in your notebook to keep track of how many times you hear the buzzword. Okay. I think we're ready for a virtual field trip. Let's go! Let's start in the alley zone. Right outside of the California Science Center, we have the Exposition Park Rose Garden. Let's use this telescope to take a closer look. As you make these observations, make a list of all the living things that you see. Okay, scientists, let's keep an eye out for all the living things we can see. Hmm, see anything here? Wait, did you see that? Is that a living thing? Do all living things have to move? What is it doing? Are there any living things here that might be hiding? We found so many different living things. When we have different kinds of living things, scientists call that diversity. As we observed, I noticed diversity in flowers. Why are there so many types of flowers? Let's look back, but this time, let's notice just the flowers. Why might it be important for there to be diversity with flowers? Let's look and think. Wow, look at all the flowers. How are these plants the same? Do you notice similar parts or colors? 
Do you notice that all the flowers have stems and leaves? Look at this beautiful flower. Oh look, it is growing from the soil and not from the grassy part. Whoa, this flower has thorns on the stem. Don't get too close scientists, they look sharp. Oh my, this flower seems to have more thorns than the last one. Why do you think these flowers have thorns? Wow, I didn't realize there were so many different kinds of flowers with so many different colors and shapes. I did notice that all flowers have similar features or parts. They had a flower, a stem, leaves, and they were all growing in soil. Now, we focused on flowers, but I know that this is not the only living thing that I saw. The Rose Garden has so many animals that live in this small habitat. I wonder how they all got there. Well, animals and insects can move, but why would they choose this place over any other place? Let's observe those living things. Notice what they are doing. Does that help us understand why they might be here? What is this furry friend doing? Does it have something in its hands? What about this bee? Why might it be interested in this flower? Well, these moths seem to be interested in the flowers just like that bee. Do you see this ant? Is it holding something? Gross, is that what I think it is? Well, those flies seem to be attracted to it. This squirrel, just like all the other creatures we found in the Expedition Park Rose Garden, seems to find what it needs to survive here. All of the diversity in plants seem to be attracting a diversity in living creatures. Do they just take from the plants without giving anything in return? Actually, the plants rely on the animals for a process called seed dispersal. As the animals eat, they are helping to move the seeds of these plants from one place to another. Since plants can't move, they rely upon living creatures to help them move their seeds. And yes, scientists, even animal droppings can help move seeds. When they are moving the seeds, they are making it possible for more plants to grow. But not all plants have seeds that animals move. How were the bee and moth helping the plants? They help through a process called pollination. Pollination is when animals in an environment help to move pollen from one flower to another to help new flowers grow. Animals like bees, birds, butterflies, moths, and even the wind can help with pollination. Wow, it's a cycle. The big beautiful plants like the flowers and trees attract insects and other living things that want to use them as food. As they eat, they are helping to disperse seeds and pollinate flowers. I wonder if we can find diversity in another place. Oh, I know. Let's check out our kelp tank. Let's go, scientists. This habitat is very different from the rose garden and even more diverse. Let's take a moment to observe this habitat. How many different living things do you see here? Let's make a list while we observe. Ready? As you observe, make a list just like you did in the rose garden. Do you notice a difference in things at the top of the kelp forest and things at the bottom of the kelp forest? Are all the living things in this environment moving in the same space? We talked about how the plants and animals interact in the rose garden. How do you see living creatures interacting in the kelp forest? Do you think seed dispersal and pollination happen in the kelp forest?
Well, scientists, that was fun. And it makes me think of someone who can help us with our question. Come on, let's go. Hi, scientists. I'm Kristen from the California Science Center. When I'm here at the Science Center, I work in the education department, making sure that we've got fun activities for you and your families when you come visit us or when you visit us online. I'm here today because I heard you have a question. Why is it important for habitat to have many different types of living things? Hmm, that's a really great question. I'm wondering if the Science Center and things around me might be able to help answer that question. What is it that you see behind me? That's right, there's a ton of plants behind me. And this area of the Science Center is right outside of ecosystems if you come to visit Space Shuttle Endeavor. So take a look around at these plants. What are some things that you notice about them? In a forest like this, scientists call the very top layer of trees and leaves the canopy. Here, our canopy is made up of bamboo. What do you notice about its leaves? They are very thin since the plants have access to a lot of sunlight. They also let more light through to the layers below. As we move down through the layers of the forest, these leaves are a lot bigger so that they can catch more sunlight. They are also a lot longer in addition to being wider. When I look underneath this plant, I see little tiny brown dots. These dots on the bottom of a fern leaf are actually its spores. That's how ferns make more ferns. And then when we move even further down, the pepper plants are um, sort of a climbing, and if you notice, they'll kind of, they've taken over the floor of this planter area, and they've even started to climb the wall of the Science Center. They really make use of any space they can get. The plants that are lower to the ground are oftentimes hidden from the sun by the big, tall plants in this ecosystem. Because they oftentimes get shaded from the sun, they usually have very wide, flat leaves so that they get the most sun exposure as they can. These plants are up a little bit higher than the plants on the very bottom, but their leaves are still pretty wide. This also helps them to catch water and divert the water towards their roots. We talked earlier about how ferns make more ferns by using spores. Ferns are the only plants that do that. Some plants use flowers in order to make more plants. What animal do you think helps by carrying pollen from one flower to another? A bee. Bees help carry pollen from one flower to another. In addition to all of the plants in this area, ecosystems also provide great homes for animals. Oftentimes, animals and plants need each other in order to survive. Thanks so much for joining me in this amazing ecosystem. Hope to see you again soon. It's time for our science sketch. And you might be wondering, why are we drawing in a science video? Well, there are a lot of reasons why sketching can help us with our science learning. As you draw, you may encounter new ideas. These new ideas are great because they can inspire you to ask more questions. Sketching also helps us learn or process information better. We are helping our brain understand science in a different way. Keeping a science notebook is also a good idea. That way we can see our thinking on our page. As we draw together, listen to the information I am giving you. What you hear will help you answer the focus question. And of course, science sketching is fun. Ready, scientists? If you want to watch this video more than once, ask an adult to help you get to our website. For this drawing, you'll need a pencil, eraser, and a black pen or thin marker. Scientists, 
Today, we are going to draw a picture to better understand how living things help a habitat grow. First, we are going to draw three parts of a habitat. On the left side of our page, we are going to draw a tree. Next, we are going to draw a squirrel. Start your squirrel by drawing a number three and extend the ends like this. Now we can add a nose, its eyes, and ears. In this open section, we will draw its hands. Now its feet. And finally, a fluffy tail. Finally, we are going to draw an acorn. Draw a line like this. Now, make a half circle that connects to the ends of the line. Draw the stem, and the bottom half will be a half oval. Finally, we're going to add these lines to the cap of the acorn. Let's use our black pen to outline our drawing and learn about how these living things connect. Plants and trees are important in a habitat. Big trees like this are great places for animals to find shelter. Also, the tree can provide food for animals as well. These yummy acorns are sure to attract creatures. This beautiful big tree is a place that a squirrel can live. While it seems like the squirrel is getting a lot from the tree, the squirrel is also helping the tree. The squirrel will help to move the seeds of the tree. That is called seed dispersal. And it happens in many different ways. Maybe our squirrel friend has too many acorns in its hands and it drops a few as it runs around. Or maybe the squirrel will bury some of the acorns to save for later. Or maybe we will find bits of the acorn after a squirrel has digested it. These are all possible ways that a squirrel can help the tree. So the squirrel will take the acorn and move it to new places. And now this little acorn has a big job. This acorn is a seed that will grow into a new tree. But it will need some help. The squirrel will help it move to a new place so that it can grow. But it also needs sunlight, water, and time. Once time has passed, it will grow into a big, beautiful tree. Scientists, I want to point out that while we drew three specific living things, this will happen with many other plants and animals in a habitat. Seed dispersal is one way a habitat can grow and change. Let's add a title. Now that we have a finished picture, how do you think this helps you answer the focus question for the day? Remember to add color because science doesn't happen in black and white. It was fun drawing with you scientists. Before we go, check out these scientists and their finished drawings. Remember scientists, you can find this video on our website. If you have a chance, tag us on our social media. Now, let's head back to the discovery room. Let's go over all the things that we did today. We started our virtual field trip in our LA zone 
where we used a telescope to make observations of the diversity in the Exposition Rose Garden. Then we made our way to our kelp forest to observe even more diverse habitats there. Next, Kristen helped us understand what plants need to grow and showed us the diversity in plants at the California Science Center. Finally, we did a science sketch with Mariela that helped us understand how squirrels help to disperse seeds to help a habitat grow. Do you remember the question of the day? Why is it important for habitats to have many different types of living things? Can you use the buzzword to answer the question of the day? Diversity. Okay, scientists, it's time to count our check marks. How many times did you hear the buzzword? Drum roll, please. And the answer is eight. We hope you enjoyed that virtual field trip. Don't forget these materials for stuck at home science. Now back to the show. This is a real lobster and it is alive. However, you may notice it's not moving at all. That's because this is a lobster molt. This is similar to when a snake sheds its skin. So what you are looking at is its old bones. The way it's able to do this is that it separates its carapace from its abdomen. This will create an opening just big enough for the lobster to squeeze out. You can see the process happening here. Once a lobster exits its old exoskeleton or exuvium, it's soft and very vulnerable to predators. It will also absorb water to make itself bigger. It will then start hardening its new exoskeleton. Once it has finished this process, it will release the excess water and shrink down inside its new bones, allowing it room to grow. Hope you had fun. See you next time. Let's do science. Check out how we experiment with electricity. This is our Tesla coil. It is made of many parts, but the three main parts shown here are the primary coil made of thick copper, the secondary coil made of thick copper coil spun hundreds of times around a tube, and the torus, which is made out of aluminum. As the Tesla coil is turned on, the primary coil passes a current or a flow of electric charge to the secondary coil. The charge builds up on the torus, and when we bring our grounding stick near the torus, we can see a discharge that looks like lightning. The purple bluish color is due to the nitrogen and oxygen molecules in the air. The Tesla coil also sends an electromagnetic field that can turn on a light bulb, but the field can only go so far. And this is our Van de Graaff generator, much less dangerous than our Tesla coil, but just as electrifying. As the belt inside spins, it creates friction, which produces static electricity. That static electricity can be discharged like this. It can also make things fly off our hands like this. It can even make your hair go up. It reminds me of the static I feel when I go down a slide. Now check out this scientist experimenting with static electricity. Hi everyone! Hi! So scientists, today we're going to make a snake charmer. The materials you will need is anything circular. We are using a paper plate, tissue paper, a pencil, scissors, and wool. Any type of cloth. Okay, so we're going to use the pencil to trace around the paper plate. What shape does this make up now? A circle. Good job. And you don't want to get out of the lines. Done. And in the middle of the circle, you're going to draw a spiral thick line. Then we're going to cut out our snake. We have finished cutting the snakes and we decorate them with pastels. You can decorate them or leave it blank. 
So now we're going to rub the balloon on the piece of wool. What do you think is happening, Camila? I don't know. I hear a noise. Yes, you do hear a noise. But there's different types of energies, a positive and a negative. They create one force, which is static electricity. Did you know that, Camila? No. Do you, what do you predict is going to happen when we rub, when we put the balloon near the snake? I predict that the snake's going to stick on the balloon. Ooh, Camila, great prediction. We have finished rubbing our balloons on the piece of wool. Let's see if your prediction is correct, Camila. Whoa! Whoa, Camila! You saw that? Yeah! That's because of the static electricity. Bye-bye! Thanks for exploring with us. See you next time! For more information, ask an adult to help you get to our website at californiasciencecenter.org forward slash funlabtv. See you there.